Coming up on Theater Talk. You do want to see Nathan Lane in The Nats. Nathan Lane has described it to me as the wittiest and the best play that Douglas Carter Bean has ever, um, ever written. And I think it's going to be a, a smash hit. People in the performers told me it was the best script they read in five <laughs> years. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about musicals. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins, and Michael Riedel is not here today, <gasps> but, but he sent us a joke. He said, usually I'm a pain in the neck to everyone, and today I have a pain in my neck. <laughs> oh, oh, good one. So, but our, our, our sound man, Jose, has given us a proxy for Michael. So. You're sticking a pen up the <laughs> bottom of, We're putting of him Michael Riedel. All so. right. So the spring season is about to roll out in the New York Theater, and I'm joined by three of my absolute favorite guests to talk about it. We have Patrick Pacheco of the LA Times and also the prominent commentator on New York One on stage. Michael Musto, columnist of The Village Voice, and soon to be disco Scott singer. Disco singer. <laughs> February 17th at 54 Below, which is Studio 54, where I used to go when it was Studio yes, 54. Right. When you were it's young nice to be back when people are on prescription drugs. <laughs> um, I'm going to actually sing disco songs with a band called Ele Electric Company. I have backup singer Snooki and Tish. I have Orfe doing a number. Wow. It's such a crazy new direction because my journalism career is just going in the toilet. Well, no, no, but this, this is fabulous. And last but not least, the wonderful Jesse Green from New York Magazine. Welcome, all of you. Now, before we jump into the brand new season, I want to sort of look back a little on what is, remains of the fall season. Jesse, well, can you <laughs> sort of remind us of what's left? Very little remains. That's one of the problems. Yeah. <clears throat> it was a kind of a race to the bottom yeah. uh, in the fall. And uh, I guess, you know, among commercial productions, all that's really left and not for very long uh, is uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I'll kill you! <laughs> and a little bit more of Golden Boy. I swear did you come here, Papa. You, you sit there like my conscience. What's fascinating about Golden Boy and, and Bart Scherr's direction is that he's almost single-handedly resuscitated Clifford Odette's reputation. First, Awaken Sing, which won the Tony that year as Best Revival, and now Golden Boy. And there's going to be another uh, Clifford Odette's revival as well, not directed by Bart Scherr, but... But Doug Hughes is... By the, the Big Knife with Bobby Cannavale, who was also in Glengarry Glen Ross. It's but such I'm, an incestuous little world that they have. <laughs> I'm looking more forward to Golden Girls with Scarlett Johansson as B. Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> That's an in-joke, but, but uh, Scarlett Johansson did speak with a very profound, <laughs> raspy voice. I hope it holds out for the sake of the producers. I don't know. I thought she had a cold, and then it got better. I oh. kind of like the fact that we had some old-fashioned, big-scale flops. <laughs> we always, no, we always yeah. bemoan the fact that Broadway's gotten too safe, that everything's so commodified, pre-tested. It has to be a surefire hit to open. Well, guess what? Along comes the performers, about adult <laughs> performers and <laughs> porn, basically. Uh, a musical about Amy Simple McPherson by Kathy Lee Gifford, Scandalous, Chaplin, uh, Dead Accounts with Katie Holmes, flop, 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 flop. Well, and The it's Anarchist uh, w with... Patty How did Lepone I forget that Winger. one? Patty Lapone and Deborah Winger. He was dead within four days or five days. But now this but. spring, they're continuing with the model of bringing big stars into some of the well, shows. I think that model is the model. That I is the model. That is the permanent state of the situation. So now we've purged ourselves of these flops. Uh, Rebecca now is looking like one of the longer runs. <laughs> uh, and now we're going back to the big stars because we have Tom Hanks coming, Cicely Tyson, Bette Midler, Patina Miller. Uh, we have a lot of big people. And those aren't even necessarily selling tickets. Alec Baldwin, I believe, Mr. Riedel, who's not here except as a fruit, uh, <laughs> wrote that Orphans is not initially selling that much. That's with Sheila Booth and Alec Baldwin. Yes, but with, in all fairness to Orphans, they barely started the publicity campaign, and he was attacking the poster, which I didn't think was so bad. Who can? But. Well, he's, he, he believes that he now has the power of foresight yeah. based on his uh, perception that the poster for Tom Hanks in Lucky Guy, Nora Ephron's play, uh, was what was holding back the box office there. And so when they changed it, as he 
prescribed, suddenly millions of dollars came pouring. Was or at least that's how he would describe it. But I will, I, will, I will channel Michael now, and he will say, but the main reason that he believes now that he is a consultant to Broadway par excellence is because of the impact that his column had on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. The biggest impact on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was Scarlett Johansson, who has sold $6 million worth of tickets yes. ahead of time. But a little so background. It's material, but, but the Regal. background, what he was referring to was Ghost Skipper. Uh, which was a device, uh, an invention of the director, Rob Ashford, to actually have the ghost materialize, this ghost that presumably was a very close to Brick, uh, in this case, uh, Benjamin Walker. And, we, and Michael made some snide comments, as a, a lot of the chat rooms made as well, that the ghost not only didn't work very well, but was incorporating musical elements because Rob Ashford is better known for his musicals yes, than the, the his ghost, dramas. The, the ghost of Brick, the dead the lover, of, dead lover the, or not, was supposed to wander Skipper. across the stage. But I sat there longing for Wait. the ghost of Skipper yes, because exactly. it would have been somebody not screaming or but not was, speaking at all. But was the ghost singing musical theater tunes? Because that would prove. He the re relationship. <laughs> well, it's a gay, it's a gay ghost. <laughs> was it Sondheim just doing Welcome to Kanagawa from Pacific Overture? I would think cats. I don't know. No, I think it was what you were just saying, right, Susan? I'm it looking was. over a four leaf clover. <laughs> but as you say, we, we, now having seen Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, we're kind of sorry Ghost Skipper wasn't there to break up the. Uh, to me, it was theater the, for the, the dead. Uh, but it will run, it will make its money, and people who have not seen the play and would not have seen it without a star in it like that, well, so they'll get an experience, maybe not a very accurate experience, but an experience of Tennessee Williams. So I don't think we need to be complaining too much about that. And it's a case in point in how a star can drive box office sales. It'll be interesting to see in the new season whether Alec Baldwin will ultimately do it, Bette Midler, Tom Hanks, or Cuba Gooding Jr., or uh, whoever else is lined up for the spring season. But in this recession environment, another thing that's coming back big time is the one-person show, because yes. that's basically low overhead, except when you have a big name like Bette Midler. But yes. Bette is playing Sue Mengers, who's the bespectacled agent, who's a great character to play. Though I would pay to see Bette read, like, Craigslist or yes. something. I don't care. But this is, I'll uh, eat you last, a chat exactly. with Sue and, and to me, that's exciting. And then um, Holland Taylor, who hasn't been on Broadway since Moose Murder, so this has to be a step up, uh, <laughs> is playing Texas Governor Ann R Richard. Uh -huh. right? yes. yeah. yeah. In a play she wrote herself, did uh, extensive research. I think while she was backstage at Two and a Half Men, you know, s avoiding the conflict of <laughs> Angus Jones and Charlie Sheen, she was writing this play about, about Ann Richards. Sue Mengers and Ann Richards are both really colorful characters. And... When there is a star of note, you want to see a star in something that fits them like, uh, like a T. You don't want to see Kelsey Grammer in Macbeth. Macbeth. Yeah. You, know. you do want to see Nathan Lane in The Nats. That's Which to me is really the testament of Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another play. <laughs> no, no, it's about a gay burlesque performer. It's written by Douglas Carter Bean, who also wrote the book for the new Cinderella that's coming. Uh -huh. He's one of the people who has two this season. Who else? Richard Greenberg has two, The Assembled Parties, and also... Uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Breakfast at Tiffany's adaptation. So this is a look back to gay life in 1920s with 1920s. a burlesque... It's thir 37. Uh, the Nance is a stock character in burlesque. Uh, the, the play itself is set in 1937. And it was a beloved uh, figure, but a sissy, sort of a Paul Lynn before there was Paul Lynn. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> You're below Michael. Why are you looking past him at me? <laughs> uh, and uh, it was often played by heterosexuals. I mean, even Al Jolson would incorporate uh, elements of the uh, Nance in his own act, interestingly enough. In this particular case, it is Burlesque, Burlesque is Dying. It's 1937. It's LaGuardia. And Nathan Lane plays a conservative Republican who is a homosexual playing this character, the Nance, in these burlesque skits. But it happens to be also be a conservative Republican. He also happens to be a conservative Republican in the ascendant Roosevelt era. It's a little different now what a Repu conservative Republican was then. Yes. Uh, but he's anti-Roosevelt. And he sort of falls in love with uh, a young man who's sleeping on a park bench uh, because we are in the Depression era. Ghost skipper by any chance? <laughs> Uh, and well, it's how it's sort of a tragic comedy. I mean, it doesn't end particularly well, but it's a fascinating piece of social history. And I think uh, Nathan Lane has described it to me as the wittiest and the best play that Douglas Carter Bean has ever um, ever written. And I think it's going to be a, 
a smash hit. People in the performers told me it was the best script they read in five years. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about musicals. Susan. Let's talk about the musicals. Now, the two big musicals I see coming in are Kinky Boots and Matilda, the, content, the big contenders for the best musical <laughs> crown. Do you see another one that's beyond those those two? Am I leaving something? Uh, for new musicals? For new so musicals. there's Cinderella. Well, that, that's that right. We don't know whether that be will a, be an original musical. In. Yes, we should say there's going, to, there's going to have to be a Tony Committee ruling on what they're that's going right. to do about Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Because that's a new book. It's never been on Broadway. It's it never been on Broadway. based on the 1957 TV movie. But of yes. course, we all know it so well. And the Brandy movie of when... Well, a lot out. of the songs, uh, not a lot, but a good goodly number of songs have been interpolated from the... Rodgers and Hammerstein trunk. Yes. So is that kosher then to come in and make it a new musical? Well, there's certainly precedent for it, uh, but there's also precedent the other way. It's really just whatever <laughs> well, the hell they want to do. Well, that'll be interesting. They'll All never right. come near the Brandy Whitney version. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but so, there's also Hands on a Hard Body. Oh, is that a musical? That is yes. a musical. Oh, yeah. The problem with that is it's based, I think, on a documentary about yeah. a real contest mm -hmm. where people mm -hmm. have to keep their hands on a car and then you win the car if you don't move your hands. How do you do Fosse choreography if you're going like this? Now, who's written the score for that? Do we it's, know? Um, is it Amanda yes, uh, Green? Fish. Uh, Trey Anastasio and Amanda Green. But I like the fact that it's such a high concept, obscure subject matter. You well, know this I mean? is the unsafe yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, this is what I like. Yeah. I mean, last year we had Newsies and Once, both gigantic hits based on kind of so so movies, right. but obviously screaming out to be musicalized. Uh, hands on a Hard Body, nobody thought, oh, let's make that a musical. That's you know, right. Except for these people. So well, I respect that. It's a very daring Kinky, concept, so maybe that'll work. To me, Kinky Boots is more of another kind of middle brown formula likable movie yes that might seem obvious for musical with the score by cindy lauper and a book by harvey firestein so that's a, a good a dynamo duo good name. and good good reviews coming in from chicago yeah i mean it had some fixing to do based on the reviews coming out of chicago but it's another feel-good drag queen musical like a lacage or there was another feel-good drag priscilla queen, queen of the priscilla <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then what well, the other one i mentioned oh matilda, matilda. that sounds wonderful that sounds like the one to beat for the Tony at this point, just from the well, buzz coming there's out There's certainly London. nothing from the fall season that will offer any competition. No. Yeah. Not but Chaplin's Matilda, games. they play online uh, this wonderful song, Revolting Children, with all these little kids. It's sort of the anti-Annie. Sunny little orphans are sort of d d uh, angry, degenerate-looking children. I hear some of those bitches in Annie are pretty mean. <laughs> and in Matilda, they've got this, this nasty old school marm played by a, a wonderful British actor. Another right. drag show. Right, another drag show. And, so and he'll be up for featured actor, right? Oh, that's Assuming an interesting Assuming he's nominated. Point. Bertie Carville, I think, leading actor. Leading I think the actor. Douglas yes. Hodge Award. So he'll yes. be against Billy Porter, who plays the drag queen in Kinky Booth. <laughs> yeah. That Why Hitler do I care? plays the drag queen. <laughs> <laughs> in so I'll Eat You Last. <laughs> but the revivals are uh, a, a little bit more competitive, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, revival musicals. There is from the fall, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which is still running, might still be yeah. running, and was quite a good yeah. revival. People we like all, it a lot. We loved all, it. Yeah. Loved yeah. it yeah. Yeah. Well, Cinderella, we still don't know. We, I guess we're assuming it'll be a new musical. Right. It'll be counted as a new musical, but there's uh, Pump Boys and Dinettes, and, and there's Pippin. And Annie. And, and Annie. Oh, and Annie. Uh, and Annie. Why did I forget Annie? <laughs> <laughs> well, because all those bitches. <laughs> um, but Pippin is uh, sounding like uh, a show that might be hard to beat from what we hear in Cambridge. I think it's going to be a hit. I think it's, it may well be a, a big hit. But we have but one more gender bending <laughs> thing here because Bettina Miller from Sister Act is playing the Ben Vereen role. Well, right. that's sort of a gender neutral role, though. She's Not good. when Ben Vereen played it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all the same. Right, but no, she, and she's a fantastic performer. And she's great yeah. at this. And she's Andrea really Martin good. is supposedly. And Andrea wonderful. Martin has a, a show stopping number yes. that's, I'm just that's amazing. We and hope that, won't happen to her what happened to the Irene Ryan who played the role originally. No, that's right. She died in the saddle, didn't she? Yes, she did. Uh, but what we wait, haven't she mentioned. She died in the saddle or on the stage? No, it, well, oh, it, never mind. You see, it's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know which metaphor you meant. <laughs> <laughs> but right we haven't along. mentioned, and I wanted to ask you since you've yes. seen it, yeah. the, the circus environment that director mm -hmm. Diane Paulus has used as, as her metaphor. How a does circus that, metaphor? Well, uh, Very not smart. just a metaphor, but a whole environment. Oh. It's right? a circus. It's, well, no, no, you no. Like, you mean like Twyla Tharp used in the Bob Dylan musical? No, it's, it's, a, it's a Cirque du Soleil. In fact, Seven Digits has come in to do some staging oh, all right. in there. And Diane Paulus is very cleverly, A, recreated through Chet Walker, the, Bob Fosse original, the original Bob Fosse choreography. So it looks fantastic. 
And then she's also brought in the circus element. She did direct Amaluna, which was the latest Cirque du Soleil edition just prior to this. And she's brought Seven Digits, an ex Cirque du Soleil member, to create a circus, circus arts atmosphere that are that is that is fairly well integrated and enhances the story. That's and it's where it's never clever. been revived on Broadway. <clears throat> and Diane Paulus did Hair, which yes. is another great environmental production. She did a great job. And the music is by Stephen Schwartz. Hello, Wicked. That's all you need to say to every girl of a certain age. It's the guy who wrote Wicked. Or every yeah. producer who's going to sign up. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. also a lot of non-girls of a slightly older age who grew up with that cast album. It's a classic uh, score it's, for some Are you class. a non-girl or a girl of a <laughs> non-certain age? I'm confused. Uh, it's part of my mystique. Okay, Patrick, please yes. tell us there's a new musical about Motown. Yes, there there is. There is a new musical about Motown. What's it called? It's called <laughs> Motown. The musical. And I think most of us, or some of us, were at the press pre pre presentation, yeah. right, which was like a red carpet thing with Barry Gordy and all these Motown stars. And it's an extraordinary body of work that he created. The big red flag here is that he's, at 80, writing the book to his own oh, story. Oh, my goodness. And, uh... Well, the age shouldn't deter us. I mean, no, no, I shouldn't be ages, especially me. <laughs> no, 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 I just think it might be a bit of a whitewash. We're not going to see him ri potentially well, ripping off artists or not giving them the right because they deserve, right. things like that. Right. Or the way he romanced Diana Ross and suddenly she became the star, which she deserved to be. But Why is it a theatrical production and not a concert? Uh, well, it has a book. I mean, don't, yeah. have you but not heard about... It, but why does it have Have, have you heard of a show called Jersey Boys? <laughs> Uh, which won the Tony and is still running and selling out. Uh, it has a book because it tells the story of the creation of Motown by using the songs integrated into the plot as well as as performance set pieces. Yeah, because it's either Smokey Joe's or, or Jersey Boys. I think that's actually a very good analogy that Michael brought up in terms of I think it just has more power behind it if it is a Jersey Boys musical that you wrap an emotional story presumably around it. But I think the big red flag is a very good writing does libretto. he have a collaborator on this, or is it just he doing As a book I, writer? Yeah. No, not yet. Huh, that's but very interesting. They almost always bring in a, another book writer. See, right? I don't think Tom so Meehan. much. Right? <laughs> yes, maybe not. I don't think so yeah. much as, of the whitewash as the fact that who's going to tell Barry Gordy no? In other words, when you get into a situation, if it's not so good, who's going to exactly. say to Barry Gordy? But you know what? This show is a guaranteed hit because I sat there and I was yeah. like, I don't even care what they're saying in between the songs. Right. The songs are so hot. Yeah. And they're beautifully choreographed, costumed. And the guy who plays Barry Gordy has three names. He's amazing. Uh, yes, he's Brandon Victor Dixon. Amazing. Oh, he's Victor wonderful. Brand. Yeah, no, he's, he's I don't see how this show could fail. It's, it's always difficult to tell because maybe it's you had great songs. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, there have been other it sort of compilations yeah. of these kind of songs. Well, this is, if you're going to have a jukebox, this is the best jukebox you could possibly have. It's true. Yeah. I think we've forgotten to talk about uh, one of the major star appearances on Broadway this season, although perhaps not a current star. Cicely Tyson <laughs> is uh, returning after many, many years in the wonderful Horton Foot play, The Trip to Bountiful, yeah. which is uh, was written as and is usually performed uh, with a cast of white actors, but in this case, I think it will work perfectly well with an all-black cat. And let me just say, that's the kind of role where an actress literally cries for two and a half hours and then picks up the Tony on the way home. Cicely's guaranteed the Tony, mark my words. Yeah, I don't know if she'd be guaranteed the Tony against such a powerful performance as Laurie Metcalf in the other place. The other place, right? Yes. Uh, but sh she has a fantastic supporting uh, cast as well. There is Cuba Gooden Jr. as her son. Yes. Uh, Vanessa Williams as her daughter in law. Uh, her daughter in law. Dola Rashad, whom we liked so much in Stick Fly last year. Right. Even though I, well, never mind. But anyway. Okay, you what? I think it's all the more impressive to uh, have your Broadway debut uh, and be excellent in it when the play seems like such a limp noodle. Oh, uh, the play <laughs> being stick fly. stick fly. So she's she's playing a, a young woman that the main character meets on the bus on her way uh, to visit for the last time uh, the town she grew up in. But this it, is the best kind of one person show where there are actually other people <laughs> up there too, you know what I mean? And Tom Hanks similarly. Did we talk about Lucky Guy? No, we guy? have not talked about okay, Lucky Guy. Okay, because that's basically a one man show where he has other people. Oh, right. it, it, and, it really isn't. It's, no, it's, I know. It's, it's a very much an ensemble play. He's uh, playing the great Mike McAlary, the reporter. Yes, and it's it's a pretty astonishing piece of work, I have to say. By from, Nora, from, the late Nora. Uh, did, did you read it? I did read it. And uh, it bears no resemblance to anything you think of as Nora Ephron, except that it's in, you know, uh, it's funny and in good spirits. You know, she doesn't have many axes to grind. But Did she write this while she was ill? Uh, she had been writing it and kept writing it, uh -huh. yes. And it's, um, you know, basically a love letter 
to the newsroom oh. of a certain era. What's her fascination with McAlary himself? I think what do you suppose she wrote about? Squad of Eve. But of course, yeah. Going for the story no matter what. Nora famously had a mother who on her deathbed told her, you know, take notes. Everything is material. And Nora started in the newsroom of And the Nora started newsroom. in the yeah. newsroom and uh, uh, you know, I think she just has a lot of respect and love for the kind of life where you go for the story and the your your camaraderie is built around that and it's it's done with great affection even though these are not Terribly appealing characters, much, much of the time. And George C. Wolf is directing that. George C. Wolf is directing. right. And the Cloud Atlas crowd is lining up for tickets. <laughs> 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 now, what about this Breakfast at Tiffany's that's opening up? What do we know about that? I hope that? they make. I hope Richard Greenberg, and I heard he is going to make it more faithful to the novella by yeah, Drew McCapote, yeah. which I think means everyone will be gay and a prostitute and <laughs> cursing a lot because the movie's a bit of a whitewash. Yes, it's kind it of a nice is. escort. <laughs> it mean, it literally just escorts you somewhere. He's a companion. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. But the reality is, if you read the novella, she is one foul mouth. I mean, she's like Angela Lansbury off screen. <laughs> she is. I never noticed that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Before we go, I want to be sure not to leave. Well, out we anything. did leave out the Testament of Mary. I think it's uh, right, a joke. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a new play by the wonderful Irish novelist Colm Toibin, mm -hmm. who now lives in Brooklyn, I believe. Uh, uh, which purports to tell the story of the Gospels, but from the point of view of Mary Magdalene. Uh, or is it Mary, the mother of Christ? No, I think it's Mary, Mary, the, mother the, mother Christ. Christ. Mary yeah. the mother of Christ. Well, that's how much I know <laughs> we about Mary that. Mary Magdalene last year <laughs> and Superstar. They're all Mary to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, and it stars the wonderful Fiona Shaw working with her, the director she often works with, Deborah Warner. With her good old friend, Deborah Warner. I'm interested to see, I don't know if you read any of Toybean's novels, but if if he can carry over into drama the kind of bubbling subtext subtextual drama in the novels it should be pretty astounding and what's right. amazing is that th that these christian themes keep going on right i mean the scandalous <laughs> so despite fair. the fact that the church is <laughs> gone despite, <laughs> despite the fact that they don't really succeed uh, with the exception of book of mormon right uh, as satire well as you satire. know but that redemption is a big topic and we have to keep going back to it <laughs> It's going to get crucified by the critics. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just quickly want to point out that off-Broadway, there's just too much for us to even talk about. We, but we've got Vanessa Redgrave coming in with Jesse Eisenberg in a play that Jesse Eisenberg wrote, The Revisionist. Right. Which yeah, I kept like, thinking I was misreading the newspaper when I, I saw that. But uh, it seems to really be true. And as usual, all of the unsafe, exciting, or not all of, but much of the unsafe and exciting stuff will be going on off-Broadway. And I'm also going to be very interested to see Here Lies Love by David Byrne, directed by Alex Timber. But the shoe budget alone. <laughs> <It's> oh. about, <laughs> about, but they have a great because, song, Imelda, well, Imelda, yes, <laughs> Don't Cry For Me, Luzon City. I think we need to say it's about Imelda Marcos, <laughs> yeah. oh, yes. or, or none of those jokes work. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's about Imelda Marcos. <laughs> Thank you. And it's directed by Alex Timbers, who actually directed Rocky Das Musical, which was the big event for me last fall and which I think will be a big success when it comes to New York. Where was that? The musical version in Germany, in Hamburg, oh. Germany. I it's really an out-of-town trial. That will be a big hit when I will think York. so, yeah, with a book by Thomas Meehan and songs by <laughs> <laughs> Lynn well, you predict. Clarity. You predict. Now, one last thing from each of you, where we have yes. to wrap up, but one last thing from each of you that you're looking forward to. I'm looking forward to uh, Passion at CSC. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Pippin again. I'm looking forward to uh, Bette Midler in uh, in the Sue Mengers. Yes. Sort of thing, yes. Uh, to Lucky Guy, <laughs> to everything we just talked about. It looks like a promising yeah, spring yeah, season. Yeah. I think there's lots to look forward to. I'm looking forward to 54 Below on Sunday. <laughs> so, I keep saying September, February, February 17th. I'll find my way there somehow. If you want to see somebody die on stage like Irene Ryan, come and see me will that you, night. Will you, will you sing I Will Survive? I'm singing it, but with seriously new satirical lyrics about eating pizza, and that's all I can reveal. And are you singing I'm It's so Raining Men? No, but I'm doing Don't Go Breaking My Heart as a duet. With Just come and watch me die. I'll be there. And yeah. Wow. I'll be appearing with the New York City Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, things I, I, other than things we've already talked about, I, I'm interested in the new Amy Herzog play, Belleville. Oh. It'll be at a New York Theater Workshop and in a revival of the last five years uh, by Jason Robert Brown that's going to be at Second Stage and uh, Far From Heaven at Playwrights Horizon. All right. Well, <laughs> good night, Michael. <laughs> Patrick Pacheco, New York One on Stage. Michael Musto, 54 Below. 
And my leg was uh, out of the cover <laughs> of the voice. Can we do an inset? Oh, no. We, you're getting this? Girl? I have fussy legs. Oh, leg? fabulous. You, uh, you, if everybody who sees this asks me, did you, did you have your legs waxed or is this Photoshop? I actually shaved it with an electric you razor. Did. You yeah. Did. I didn't have to go for the waxing. Thank yes, you. and then go online, everyone, for Michael Musto was tan mom. <laughs> and thank you, too, Jesse Green. Thank you, Susan. And, thank and you. wasn't this a better show without Michael Riedel? Who? Yes. Michael who? Yes, please, please. Yes, please, please write in if you enjoyed this show without Michael Beale. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Thanks a lot. Phones are ringing off the hook. <laughs> like you. a night without Shelley Winters. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.